Support for Trifles comes from the BSI Press. Manuscripts, collections of papers by international writers, and books covering a wide range of other Sherlockian topics. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And by listeners like you, who choose to support us on Patreon for as little as $1 a month. Patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the problem was final, the house was empty, and his bow was last, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Why would the Pope engage Sherlock Holmes' services? Why did he receive the Legion of Honor from France? And why would he refuse a knighthood? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 286, Strange Businesses. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even know where to start with, with strange and business in the title here. I mean, I could go in 15 different directions with you. Um, how's business? Oh, strange. It's really, <laughs> it's really strange. <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. No, you know, um, well, you know, one of the things I did was board up the front door, and now a lot of my time during the course of the average business day is taken up by listening to customers just sort of running their fingernails over the wall from the outside, muttering. That's always the way, isn't it? Well, you know, next thing you know, you'll be gnawing at the wallpaper. Oh, that was earlier today. Oh, lovely. Well, <laughs> yeah. be careful out there. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, folks, while you're gnawing at the wallpaper and listening to us, we would remind you that the show notes for this episode are available at iHose.co slash trifles286. That'll take you directly to the Sherlock Holmes podcast.com landing page where you'll find any notes related to what we're talking about today. And just a reminder, it's an opportunity for you to join as a patreon supporter every single one of our patreon supporters is eligible for a drawing that we do every month and every quarter uh, the monthly drawing is for back issues of the baker street journal and the quarterly drawing is for a free year's subscription to the bsj so just get to sherlockholmespodcast.com or patreon.com slash trifles to become a supporter for as little as one dollar a month. It all helps toward going toward the research and the running of the show, and helps us to be constantly creative and entertaining, or as constantly and creative and entertaining as a dollar a month you think would be worth. <laughs> so. I've, I've always had a question I've never asked you about the monthly drawing. Please. Are there any rules? I mean, can people just do still lives, or does it have to be fruit or animals? <laughs> um. You know, we're we're getting into dangerously close territory to the answer to the canonical couplet on our other podcast, I Hear of Sherlock <laughs> Everywhere, uh, where, where your interpretation, Bert, is, um, well, shall we say, um, tangential at best. Uh, well, well, you know, I'm a big fan of math, so I'm happy to be associated with tangents. <laughs> Well, strange businesses it is, and um, I think this is one of those episodes that was inspired by a listener. Uh, I can't remember offhand who wrote to us uh, and suggested that we might look into businesses that either had strange names or were involved in something um, unusual, shall we say. 
And and the example they gave, which is perfect for us to lead off, to, to kick off this discussion, I should say, uh, comes early on in the Sherlockian canon, in, in The Adventure of the Red-Headed League. Holmes and Watson are wandering about uh, towards Saxe Coburg Square. And Holmes, I think, is going by memory uh, from a certain point. But uh, they do mention a, uh, a vegetarian restaurant. And I think that's something we covered in a past episode. We talked about uh, foods and, uh, and food stuff in the canon. And we covered uh, the, the vegetarian restaurant. Um, and and as, I, as I figure that out, I will, as I figure out which episode that was, I will let you know. But, um, hmm. but I'd like to add, and our listeners, probably very few of our listeners would know this, but that's yeah. sort of an in-joke by Conan Doyle, because George Noons, who founded The Strand magazine, raised the money to get the publication started from his profits from selling a vegetarian restaurant that he operated, I think, in Birmingham. Yeah. And, and so uh, there is kind of a interesting connection to the publisher there. There, there, there was a, a really nice connection. I think we covered that in that episode. It was episode 163, Victorian Vegetarians. Oh, right. So... Um, so, yeah, it was uh, near Saxe Coburg Square. We find there's a Mortimer's, the tobacconist, little newspaper shop, the Coburg branch of the City and Suburban Bank, uh, the Vegetarian Restaurant, and McFarland's Carriage Building Depot. Um, but Holmes also mentioned that there was an artificial, uh, I think it was Holmes that mentioned it, an artificial kneecap manufacturer, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. Oh, I, I, now I'm, now I'm, 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 I'm losing the reference. Yeah, look it up quickly. Kneecap, yeah, but this is this is a mis misdirection. Yes, that's so, what it was. So Jabez uh, Wilson, I guess, uh, you know, is mentioning a an address, seventeen King Edward Street near St. Paul's. I started off, Mister Holmes, but when I got to that address, it was a manufactory of artificial kneecaps, and no one in it had ever heard of either Mr. William Morris or Mr. Duncan Ross. That's that's the one, yeah, because it was right after the Red-Headed League was dissolved that uh, Jabez Wilson went to uh, William Morris, who was the solicitor who uh, uh, was using the, the, the room as a temporary convenience. Um, he said, yes, he, the, the forwarding address that they left was 17 King Street, so... King, King Edward Street. So that was it. He, he was sent off to an artificial kneecap manufacturer. Now, uh, just uh, <laughs> how... I'm, I'm trying to picture in Victorian times an artificial kneecap. Uh, if it is something that is, a, you know, a surgical uh, implant or if it is uh, literally a protective device that a laborer might wear. Do you, do you have any sense as to what artificial kneecap manufacturers would actually be making in the 1890s? Well, I take it as read that it's a replacement kneecap, but I don't have any knowledge or real understanding of the degree to which implants of any kind were typical in Victorian England because of uh, well, for a variety of reasons. I mean, surgical skill, the availability of what we take for granted today, you know, x-rays and other, in, and other information sources that allow you to figure out exactly where, how large this particular kneecap should be and how it would be inserted in the knee and so on. I mean, I can imagine things that were being used to treat wounded soldiers or people who had, you know, had lost limbs or had broken their knees but mm. exactly what you did with it who made it how many sides I'm, I'm like a number three and number three <laughs> kneecap i'm sorry sir we only have the number four today but if you hobble back on wednesday i'm sure i can get you a number three i have no idea how that worked yeah i i don't either and looking in the encyclopedia sherlockiana i can't find any reference to uh knees artificial kneecaps um, but it does bring to mind if if it was something that was external, uh, you know, the, and there was a market for those. I mean, such that one could actually 
uh, walk up to their uh, manufacturing address uh, means they must have been commercially available. And if, if they were available to tradesmen and, and other folks who spent time on their knees, um, that may be Mrs. Hudson herself. Uh, she went to it on her knees with the, uh, with the wax bust that she was uh, rotating as uh, Holmes and Watson uh, were, were uh, across the street in the empty house. Remember, she, she said she was on her knees there. Um, then artificial kneecaps might have been just the thing that um, the busy landlady would have needed. <laughs> Tough to say. Yeah. Tough to say. But that's, that's one example of a, uh, an odd, a strange business that we find in uh, the canon. What, what else do we have? Well, I think just to close that out, I was just looking online for a second and... It, apparently, they're closer to what we would call today knee braces or protectors rather than uh, implants or anything surgically implanted. Okay. But there are, there are plenty of other things. You know, one of the things you find when you look at the cases of Sherlock Holmes, the names, you know, beyond what these businesses do. Of course, one of my favorite odd businesses in the canon is is the business of Mr. Sherman, whom we encounter for the first time in Sign of Four. You know, Holmes says to Watson, um, what's happened in the case is Watson is really sort of shaken about the most recent experiences he's had. And they, they, he and Holmes decide Mary Morstan needs to go home, back to uh, Mrs. Forrester's house. And so Watson says, you know, I, I'll take her in a cab or a carriage or something. And, um, but, and Watson says, you know, this re all this excitement really has shaken me. And so Holmes, of course, gives him another errand. <laughs> <laughs> well, once you've dropped her off, uh, he says, why don't you go to uh, Sherman's? He's a bird stuffer. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's got to be a wonderful occupation. Can you imagine having that on your business card, bird stuffer? Holmes says the third house on the right is a bird stuffer. Sherman's is the name, and you will see a weasel holding a young rabbit in the window. And then, of course, he's told to bring back a dog but not just any dog toby is uh is is needed to help track these uh these marks mm. that's great well you know i mean we we do have uh we we have bird stuffers around the house uh around thanksgiving time <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and then there and then there's my favorite dog related dealer name in the canon, Ross and Mangles. Oh, yes. Love <laughs> Ross and Mangles. Yeah, if Sherman can't help you, you need something fiercer, go to Ross and Mangles. Yes, yes. I, I've never been Rossed by a dog. <laughs> I have been mangled before. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Ross and Mangles, of course, is the source of the animal that becomes the Hound of the Basket. Oh, spoiler so, alert. Yeah, yeah. I should have said something. Yeah. Sure. No, that, that is a good one. I like that. And, um, you know, we mentioned the wax bust before, uh, and, and Holmes himself actually engaged uh, a master in waxworks to, um, to do the bust of him. It was uh, Monsieur Meunier of Grenoble. Yeah. Uh, had a had a waxworks. And, you know, th th this was, well, well after the time that um, Madame Tussaud had uh, opened her shop. Uh, her, her curiosity, uh, the Museum of Waxworks, uh, just down the street, actually, from Holmes and Watson uh, in Marlebone. Mm. Yeah, I think the original Madame Tussaud goes back to the French Revolution, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, that's so, that's yeah. right, 1780s, 1790s or so. Mm. So, yes, but uh, you, you don't often hear of uh, someone who is a wax worker. No. But and then in, in Mazarin Stone, uh, the yes. Waxworks comes back, but it's a different name. It's um, Ta Tavernier, I think, uh, who's associated with the Waxwork in Mazarin Stone. Oh, how do you like that? He didn't go back to... Um... Well, it's interesting because Holmes uh, got the bust done by Meunier... And that was in, in uh, Grenoble, France, right? Mm -hmm. That which would have been on his way back to Baker Street yeah. before uh, the empty house started, which means he must have known that he was going to be up against Colonel Moran 
to have come home with a wax bust of himself for just such a purpose. He's lucky he wasn't traveling in the summer. (laughs) (laughs) He'd be a regular Vincent Price. (laughs) Well, uh, speaking of price, uh, the price of admission here is one ad that you need to listen to. We will put this in your ears and we'll be back right after this quick word. If you're a regular listener of Trifles, you'll know that we also have another show called I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. And of course, we do hear of Sherlock Everywhere around the globe, and it's partially due to the BSI Press. The BSI Press has been doing the international series for well over a decade, and it takes you to places that, well, you couldn't otherwise go without the BSI Press's help, and that is inside scholarship coming from Sherlockian societies from all corners of the globe. You'll find Japan and Sherlock Holmes, Scandinavia and Sherlock Holmes, Australia, Italy, Spain, Canada. The list continues to grow. So if you're interested in what people from all around the world have to say about Sherlock Holmes, find that common bond at the BSI Press website, BakerStreetIrregulars.com, and pick out an international volume of your choice today. All right, we're back, keeping strange company with each other. Um, so we had uh, we talked about uh, waxworks. We talked about artificial kneecaps. Um, why don't we make our way uh, into the seedier section of London <laughs> that we find in the Man with the Twisted Lip? And we know Kate Whitney has uh, spied her husband. Uh, I. No, sorry, not Kate Whitney. It was uh, Mrs. Sinclair has spied her husband out of the uh, upper window of uh, a place called the Bar of Gold. That sounds promising. Well, what, what's the Bar of Gold? Bert? Well, it's uh, an opium den, and that's another thing that would be wonderful to see on a calling card, wouldn't it? <laughs> you must, must <laughs> uh, let me give you my, my business address. Bar of Gold, you know, opium den. Uh, I prefer opium study myself, <laughs> or opium library, mm, but opium man cave. Man cave. Yes, <laughs> but you had noted, you know, that the opium den, the bar of gold, is on a very interesting street. Yes, yes, uh, Upper Swandham Lane, which is kind of in the in the seedier section of uh, of London, um, but interestingly enough. Uh, Upper Swandham Lane, as uh, Watson says, is a vile alley lurking behind the high wharves which lie on the north side of the river to the east of London Bridge. And, and, and this, is, this is interesting because we, we get two other uh, kinds of businesses, one of which is, well, should be fairly familiar. Uh, the other is, is um, a less common term. Uh, Watson says, between a slop shop and a gin shop, approached by a steep flight of steps leading down to a black gap like the mouth of a cave. See, man cave. I found the den of which I was in search. So slop shop and gin shop. I mean, we we know what a gin shop is, right? Oh, yeah, it's a place you get a genie. (laughs) If you want to make three wishes, you just pick up one one of those lamps that the gin shop will sell you and hope you get a friendly gin. Uh, stop it's hurting it's hurting no um no i mean that's where you could go and just get a drink right i mean it's uh i i I would imagine it would be like a bar but they only serve gin right yeah but uh, but what's a slop shop is that is that is that like a cafeteria (laughs) (laughs) well in a way apparently it's a term used to designate a shop that sells Cheap secondhand clothing, or, or very, you know, inexpensive off the rack clothing. Oh, off the rack. Ra- yeah, you know, you don't often think about uh, clothing necessarily as off the rack. There was, well, we were we were at the still at the early stage of the industrial revolution at that point, and millineries and uh, factories and whatnot cranking out uh, shirts and trousers and whatnot. But 
I would imagine most things were handmade, hand sewed, uh, bespoke, etc. Yeah, I mean there were you you great population of tailors, particularly in the city of London, beyond Savile sure. Row, but just you know the or, ordinary neighborhood tailor. And I imagine you would go to your tailor, and and it, and it, in addition, you know, the, there was generally less variety. And, and, mm. and changes in style, and so I would imagine a gentleman would have a very small number of suits. Um, you know, there was no dry cleaning in those days, so clo- clothing was right. brushed, right. and you would have a couple of suits from your tailor, and that would be about it. Yeah, interesting. And uh, according to uh, the Encyclopedia Sherlockiana, uh, Slop Shop is a, sh- is a shop where slops are sold. Uh, slops uh, are indeed ready-made clothes. Slang for ready-made hmm. clothes. Now here's so. a question. Um, yes. Can you tell me where in the canon we find the profession of hop merchant? Hop merchant. Um, hmm. It sounds like someone who is in the brewing business um, or in, in the grain business. Um, well, I, was, I was completely I'm, mystified by this myself. I just sort of I'm blanking on it. it. Where, well, you would think that it would be in Veiled Lodger and the hop merchant would be associated with the circus. But no, it's not that sort of hopping at all. It's, <laughs> it's actually Grant Monroe. Grant Monroe in the yellow face it's a throwaway oh. line. You know, he, he describes himself yeah. as a hop merchant. But that's hmm. completely unconnected to the case, of course. And um, if someone would have asked me, you know, who was the hop merchant in the Sherlock Holmes can, and I would have said, yes. no, I can't imagine there is one. But there you are. It goes with the, the flamingo that uh, you also wouldn't think it would appear in the Right, can. right. Yeah, you don't pay much attention to either of those. So hop merchant... Uh, according to, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> I don't know if this is actually the case or not. Um, it's uh, obsolete slang. It's a teacher of dancing. No, that's, that's what the, that sounds that's, like a nineteen twenties. It, it could be uh, jargon. No, I would take it that it could he's be. actually providing hops to breweries. Yeah, that's that's what I now would my imagine. one of my yeah, favorite but, uh, professions. You know, the lovely thing about this is that you find, first, two things. You First, you find all these wonderful names. Um, and occasionally, you come up with a, with a real name. You know, so in Hound of the Baskervilles, mm. I think it's Sir Henry who says that he's, as soon as, you know, he's more comfortable there in Baskerville Hall, he, he basically says, I'm going to put in a generator and there'll be this very bright light. And he says, a swan mm. and Edison. Well, actually, the real name of that company mm. is Edison Swan that went back to the 1980s. So he's going to put a generator in and get power there. But there are other wonderful names. Um, you know, and usually they come, they come together. Um, you know, one of them we talked about earlier was in the red circle, Castellata and Zamba, the, the fruit mm. importers. And these are people appara- apparently oh. that Gennaro Luca did a favor for in the United States. But... It, I got it. Yeah, Zamba. I I was thinking either of an, another dance <laughs> or uh, some kind of athletic activity. Um, I don't know. Oh, that's Samba and Zumba. Yeah. I'm sorry, sorry, but yeah, that's uh, that's wonderful. I mean, how uh, realistic, right? From the Italian quarter, Castellate and Zamba. It, it it sounds like a fruit importer that you you would encounter in yeah, the city. And and that you know, it's interesting too because. One of the great cases in the canon, of course, is the missing three-quarter. And there is a contemporary firm. There are a variety of contemporary firms that have chosen their name in an effort, among other things, to indicate that they've been in business for a long while, when in fact they haven't. And one of them is Gilchrist and Soames, taking its, taking mm. its name... And this is a perfumery and manufacture of soaps and shampoos and so on. And they take their name from characters in the missing three quarter. Yeah, uh, no, from the three students. Oh, the three students, actually. you're right. You're three right. students, yeah. yeah. Gilchrist was right. uh, one of the, uh, he, he was the actual right, perpetrator. Right. And Soames, of course, was the manservant to uh, 
No, to, he was what the. Was it? No, Bannister was the manservant. Was the Soames professor. was the yeah, the tutor. The, yeah. Right. Yeah. So Gilchrist. Yeah, and it turns out Gilchrist and Soames as a company has been around since 1983. <laughs> 1983, <laughs> so, not 1883. Yeah. No, no, not not 1893. But another old style uh, company that uh, kind of lended credence to a con man in the canon. We find in the stockbroker's clerk. Uh, with the Franco Midland Hardware Company. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but the first time I read that when I was a young boy, I saw Franco Midland Hardware Company. I literally thought of a hardware store. Oh, well, it's but, not a bad thing to think of. No, but I, yeah, but I mean, you know, you think, think of, uh, you know, the, the Victorian era we didn't have hardware stores back then and of course the terminology hardware is you know broader than just uh you know tools and essentials for uh the norwood builder shall we say Mm -hmm. but um but in that story uh there was uh, again to uh lend credence to the uh the, the tale uh we see mention of new zealand consolidated you ever heard of New Zealand Consolidated before? <laughs> I'm glad before? someone has brought the country together. <laughs> Friends, <laughs> is your old Zealand messy and spread out all over the house? Well, you need New Zealand Consolidated. Uh, no, evidently this is a stock on the London Stock Exchange. And as a matter of fact, we find uh, New Zealand Consolidated mentioned by none other than Mary Sutherland, whose uncle Ned left her some shares of New Zealand. Oh, interesting. So it uh, it gets around. I don't know if it was the if if it was the Amazon or Tesla of its day, some valued stock. That might be an interesting study for mm. someone. Well, there are lots of interesting things to pursue in terms of the names of companies and businesses in the canon. One is Morrison, Morrison, and Dodd, which a lot of people have speculated about <laughs> over the years. And this, of course, comes from uh, the, the Sussex Vampire. And all we know about that firm is in the curious letter <laughs> that they send to Mr. Holmes, yes. which says, you know, that basically we've got a client who uh, is from a group of tea brokers. And and we don't know anything about vampires because our firm specializes upon the assessment of machinery. (laughs) (laughs) Must be quite a little, quite quite a firm. You know, if you visited the offices of Morrison, Morrison and Dodd one day to see what machinery they were assessing. (laughs) Well, and that alone... I mean, it's okay, so you assess machinery. Uh, that, that's Morris and Morrison and Dodd, which really sounds more like a, a legal firm when yeah. you think about it. Um, but they assess machinery. Robert Ferguson, who is their mm. client, that, that's how the, the connection was to be made in, in the Sussex Vampire. Um, he's of the firm Ferguson and Muirhead, tea who brokers. are tea mm. brokers. What on earth do tea brokers need with machinery. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, because your tea... Well, I guess they may have machines that are packaging. Although I would think most of that packaging was weighed out manually by hand, and then... Uh, well, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? I, you know, this, this could be the old ruse of, uh, you know, the CIA or MI6 cover for importer-exporter. Oh, right, right. You know, Bob Ferguson could have been a spy. And then there's yeah. one of my favorite, um, another one of my favorite professions elsewhere in the canon, you, you find in, uh, in the Blue Carbuncle, where we have this little window, not necessarily into Covent Garden, which Holmes and Watson visit, but in the layers in the supply chain associated with geese. <laughs> because <laughs> because you, have, you have Mr. Breckenridge, Breckenridge, who is the poultry salesman, so he's clearly some sort of distributor. And then you have Mrs. Oakshot, who is clearly the poultry breeder or the wholesaler. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there you've got two people who, um, well, of course, Ms. Oakshot does other things. She has eggs and, and other things that she provides. But um, I always thought that was just interesting. I've, I've got to give all my geese to Mr. Breckenridge, and then he's going to distribute them throughout the city. 
Well, it's fortunate that that supply chain was as concentrated as it was because it allowed Holmes to kind of retrace the steps of the, the goose. And that, as they say, is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. But what do you know of this business? A good deal.